Good morning. Thank you so much for having me. It's really an honor to be here. Um, I was one of the original people that wrote this grant and very much believe in the work that you're doing. So I left um, UBHC about a year ago, almost exactly a year ago. Um, so it seems very fitting to be able to come back here um, and to be able to talk to you and to learn from one another. Um, I did come from the Sandy Hook area. Um, I didn't realize that I should have, but I didn't realize that the bulk of my drive would be in Newark, so I apologize for the delay in getting here. Um, I tried to do some deep breathing, because you know that's what psychologists do, deep breathing. <laughs> um, it does work. Um, anyway, um, so let's get started. I know we only have about an hour, a little bit more together. I want to make this interactive, so let's, um, you know, if you have questions or if there's something you want to share about your experience, I would really appreciate that because I think it will make it a richer presentation um, for everybody. Um, so today I really want to talk about understanding the family context in early intervention. So our goals today will be twofold, and I'm going to try to squeeze a lot in in a very short period of time. There's mountains and decades of research on some of the topics I'm going to be talking about today. So I'm going to really simplify it um, and just sort of um, you know, go over some of the key points. Um, and I want to talk about sort of practical tips for assessing the family context in your pediatric practice. I think um, the most useful um, component of these presentations is making sure you leave not with just the theory and the research, but also how can you apply this in your everyday life in working with children and families. So I just want to quickly review again some of the statistics. I know you're familiar with it, but every time I see them, it um, you know, reminds me um, how significant a problem we have in our country in terms of access to services. So one in five of our kids have a diagnosable mental illness. Approximately 50% of these, as you know, um, start to occur or begin in the early teens. And it may occur as early as 7 to 11 years old. One in 10 of our youth has a serious emotional disturbance, um, which impairs their ability to function in a school, community, and or family setting. This leads to lower school achievement, greater involvement in the criminal justice system, fewer stable and longer term place, long term placements in the child welfare system, not to mention the cost um, that uh, we incur as a society in all these other systems because of our failure or inability to meet the needs of children. And this is the, the statistic that always gives me goosebumps. So 75 to 80 percent of our kids with a mental health disorder, disorder do not receive services in our country. So I dug a little deeper because I found um, some additional statistics from the CD CDC, just about New Jersey in particular. Um, if you look at Essex County, for every 10,000 kids in Essex County, there are only six child psychi psychiatrists. Does that surprise anybody? At this point, maybe no. In terms of social workers, who are the primary providers of therapeutic intervention, there's only 30, or actually 29, in Essex County for every 10,000 children. And it's about 20% for psychologists. So as you know, as psychiatrists, as pediatricians, you're really ideally positioned in a child's medical home to be a point of entry in intervention and prevention for mental health disorders, emotional and behavior problems for children and their families. You've established a very secure and comfortable relationship. You have a continuity in your relationship. You know you will see your kids every year. I just want to ask, how many of you are using screens in your office as of today that assesses symptomatology in the children. If you could show me by a number of hands. Okay. And for those of you, if you don't mind me um, picking on you, who are using them, 
what have you found in terms of your experience? Has it enhanced your ability to identify emotional and behavioral challenges in the kids that you work with? Yeah. I had my daughter's well visit yesterday morning, and I was telling them I was coming up here to do Grand Rounds. And you know, they've had their collaborative hub in Monmouth County um, for a couple more years um, with Meridian. And I, I was telling them what I was doing, and you know, I'm not a pediatrician, and uh, it's not my discipline, and I really wanted to make sure this presentation was tailored. So I said, well, what kind of advice do you have for me? And the first thing he said to me is, i got to tell you, in my 30 years of practice, what happened four years ago when we joined the collaborative changed everything that I did. He said, now I have conversations with the kids. And I actually, in my well visit, for the first time, actually filled out the pediatric symptom inventory on my, my child. Um, maybe a little uncomfortable, but I did it. Um, you know, which I think is a very common reaction for all caregivers, right? You're putting something down on paper that is very much stigmatized in our society. And in many cases, our children are labeled. On the other hand, if you have that comforting relationship, and he was the first, I'm in a large pediatric practice, he was the first person to meet my daughter in the hospital, I knew that Dr. Miller um, wouldn't judge me. Uh, but that feeling of anxiety was still there. He said it changed the way you practice four years ago. So how many of you have parents or caregivers that come through your door and say this to you? Everything else is fine at home. I don't know what's going on with her. I don't know where she came from. Sound familiar? We don't talk like that at home. I don't know where she got that from. She didn't learn that behavior from me. He's a special kind of kid, right? There's always that one kid in the family that is identified as the problem child. I think that was like an ACDC song. <laughs> um, and a Beach Boys song, too. And it's funny because as I pulled this piece of clip art from the web, I realized this morning when I looked at it again, it almost looks exactly like my daughter. <laughs> she's 10, and this is exactly what she looks like when she's frustrated with her homework and just says, Mommy, I just want to scream in a pillow. And so I thought that was kind of interesting. I think it hit home for everybody. We have this natural tendency to label children, right? It's not me, it's them. But what we need to start to conceptualize and understand and help parents move toward guardians, caregivers, is that behavior happens within a context. It happens within a family context. Good morning. So we do know through decades of research that there is an intergenerational transmission of child psychopathology. It's pretty clear. There's indicators that if you have uh, family members who have a history of severe mental illness, that it is likely your risk will increase. But the other thing that we know is that there's environmental factors that can both mediate and mitigate the expression of those genes and those, that inheritance. So there is transmission through some mechanism, mechanisms. It's not a perfect and linear process. And environmental processes play a seminal role in that tra transmission, like parenting style. I just wanted to go over a, a couple statistics. There is a lot of research on severe mental illness. Um, in particular, schizophrenia, bipolar, and depression. If you have a parent or a grandparent or a cousin, aunt or uncle, um, your chances increase um, that, that your child, too, might develop similar symptomatology. There's a lot of variability across expressions. So um, you know, it doesn't mean that a, a child who has a parent who has bipolar is necessarily going to end up with being diagnosed with bipolar, but they may end up with some kind of mood disorder. So the rates of mental disorders in children really vary across studies. Depression, major depressive disorder. Children are two to three times more likely to develop depression if a parent or sibling has depression. And autism, something we see the most inherited um, and highly linked developmental disorder. 
There's a 50% chance of developing autism spectrum disorder if a biological parent has the same diagnosis. Risk increases 10 times if a sibling is diagnosed with autism. So one of the things um, that I've learned in my travel as a practicing psychologist and just in reading the literature and the research is that there's a lot of really good information about what in the family and the family dynamic contributes to the mitigation or the mediation of the development of child psychopathology. But one of the things that's almost always absent from the literature that's independent of that in other bodies of literature, and they're not coupled together, is a very simple understanding first of the family context. What is the framework that supports the ideas, the traditions, the values, and the beliefs, and the structure in which the dynamics play out, those environmental factors play out to mitigate or mediate risk? So when meeting with children and their caregivers, it's really important to ask both of them, who do you consider your family members? I hope that's not my phone. <laughs> Who do you consider your family members? Based on different cultures, this could mean different things for every single child in your practice, right? So my daughter calls my best friend an aunt. And, you know, another child might call their neighbor an uncle, even though they're not biologically related. Who lives in the household? Is there an extended family? Is there a friend? Um, is it just the immediate family? Is there a father who's involved? Is there a mother who's involved? Who are responsible for the primary caregiving duties? Are there visitors that come in? Are there people that are influencing the child in the context of that family system that have an impact on the development of the child that you're seeing? Who is responsible for discipline? So the person bringing the child in for the well visit or the sick visit may not necessarily be the person that provides the most parenting. Really important, not surprising. And these are very simple questions, but things we often forget to ask in the context of our work. And that goes for me as a psychologist, as a provider. And sometimes it's as simple as having the child draw their family on a piece of paper and explaining who the key people are. Keeping that in mind, there's two major themes uh, in terms of family influential factors that I want to go over today, um, keeping the family context in mind. Both attachment, attachment style, and parenting style, which is really more so parenting quality, right? <laughs> So John Bowlby in the late 60s, early 70s had a theory that, that the first relationship that an infant has with a caregiver is the most influential. In fact, it's a blueprint for all other relationships in their life. Mary Ainsworth took this theory and she did observational studies in which she really took the time to look at mother-child dyads and to try to come up with um, a theory around the different types of attachment styles and how they are or are not predictive of the development of emotional and behavioral problems. And there's been a large body of research that has followed as a result that's very rich, that shows a lot of causal relationships. And the theory goes that there's two types of attachment. There's a secure and there's an insecure attachment. And there's three types of primary attachments that were identified early on. The secure attachment is one that's defined by stability, security, and a sense from the child that their needs will be met at the most vulnerable time in their life, that they can rely on the caregiver to meet those needs in a predictable fashion. So they can develop a sense of self, and they can develop the sense in our world that they are lovable and they can love, and that relationship is reciprocal. On the other hand, an insecure attachment, which could be ambivalent, or avoidant, or in more recent literature, disorganized, is characterized by great instability and insecurity to varying degrees. That really affects sort of the model and the blueprint for how a child might perceive 
uh, relationships early on and as they progress through various de developmental stages in their life. Typical behavioral signs in your office or through self-report or parent report or family report of an insecure attachment are really um, characterized by a child who has very, um, in some cases, um, inappropriate boundaries. So this is the child that runs right up to your face <laughs> and says, hi, when you just met them. This is a child who has no inhibition about going up to somebody in the store, leaving their mother or father or caregiver and taking off without even looking back. This is the child that gets lost in the Costco, <laughs> right? Because there's no relative sense based on that early template about what that boundary is and what is safe and what is not safe. So the learning was not there to incorporate and internalize the appropriate boundaries to maintain that safety and stability in life. Actually, I have this is just a brief three-minute video I just wanted to show. I, I like this because it highlights three types of attachment, and it's pretty self-explanatory, so I'll leave it at that. And this is um, by Mark Waters. He's a researcher and who carried out more observational studies on parent-child attachment styles. And here you'll see three different ones that are highlighted. This experiment, which I watched through a two-way mirror, is designed to gauge how secure is the crucial relationship between mother and child. Okay, this bunny is going to go here, and that bunny will be on top. The value of the test has been established in studies that would watch a child, one-year-old, and then follow it up and interview them about the relationships to their parents when they were 21 years old. So we're quite confident in the long-term significance of this relationship. After several minutes play, the mother is signaled to leave the room. The key moment in the experiment is the child's reaction to her mother's return. The important clue is whether the baby's able to become calmed down by the contact with the mother and get back to play. Sometimes it takes a couple of minutes. But you see, when the mother was out, she was only interested in the mother, no interest in the toys. Now she has a contact with the mother, she's beginning to show a little interest in the environment, and shortly she'll be right back with the toys where we started. So you would call this a secure one? Yes, yes. She's certainly much happier. Goes to the door following her. Now, we, we sent the mother right back in, but the point here is not to distress the baby, we're just trying to challenge it. The baby puts her hands to her face in a sad expression, puts her face down. When she picks her up, she keeps her head down, her arms out, and then she sits in the chair holding the baby. The baby's still sullen. He's, he's, he's low-keyed. So you would call the, this insecure? Yes, attention. insecure. He's avoidant. He's, he's not engaging her, and it's not the, the reunion's not effective. And it's important to remember here that the thing that upset him was her absence. Her, re her return should be the solution to his problem. Now this is another pattern that we see in babies who are not good at using their mother as a secure base at home. This baby is also insecure. But you'll see, we get a look at his play before the separation. The mother's left. And when she returns, she picks him up. He can't calm down. He's still upset. She offers a toy to amuse him or to comfort him or to distract him, and he slaps it away. She offers another. He slaps it away. He's angry. He's, he's, we call these babies resistant or ambivalent because they both 
want her back and yet can't use the contact. We think that the difficulty is that in the past, when he sought comfort, she's been inconsistent as to whether she's available and responsive or not. Those attachment styles and the parenting is really passed down in many ways. Um, what you're raised with is, is your normal, your exposure as a parent. And often those styles, that, that attachment style, that way of responding to a child in distress or any kind of reaction to any kind of emotion is often something that's been learned um, from the parent or the caregiver themselves. And attachment is really closely related to parenting quality. You know, it used to be called parenting styles, but um, in recent years, um, the new terminology is really parenting quality because it's such a dynamic relationship, right? Uh, and one impacts the other. And in many cases, um, it can turn into a cycle. There's a mountains of research on the different types of parenting strategies and styles and quality that exist, but there's been four that are been, have been boiled down in the research. Authoritative, which is your ideal parenting style in which there's a high degree of warmth in the relationship. Positive, assertive control, high expectations in adolescence. Authoritarian, low warmth, high conflict, coercive, punitive control attempts. I was thinking the other night I was out for my sister's birthday and um, my niece, who's a teenager, and was being very sassy, by the way, um, was really giving my sister a hard time at the table. Um, I don't know, they got into something and she was just sort of being, in my mind, a typical teenager. And she said to me as she's leaving, didn't I, you know, mom's going to like ground me for like four weeks right now. <laughs> just because of that one interaction. Um, I think often what happens, um, when you're in an office, it's hard to sort of pick apart when you're trying to deal with um, sort of a, a health issue or a developmental issue to start teasing apart some of these um, nuances that are critically important because of time restraints, um, because of workload. But even asking the question, tell me about the most common problem you have with your son or daughter. What is the thing that you argue the most about? The homework? Is it bedtime? Is it going out with friends and not being in by curfew? How is that handled? Who is the person that addresses that? Does dad stay up or grandma and wait to see if he or she walks in the door sitting on the couch? Does everybody go to bed? Um, are you up having a lecture until 3 o'clock in the morning afterwards? Is it a long, drawn-out um, power struggle between a 10-year-old and a, a parent trying to get them to do their homework? Um, so when you think about parenting quality, there's really two factors that always configure into that um, equation, and it's respons responsivity and sensitivity and issues of control and expectations to a lesser degree. So really that warmth and, and the control or the power struggle that occurs in that dynamic and that relationship, how it's reinforced and how it's executed. So starting by asking the caregiver, tell me about the most common problem. What happens? Walk me through it. Who is the disciplinarian? How is it managed? What is the punishment? Do you lose watching TV for a month or is it a half hour? In some cases with parents, it's five minutes. Okay, you can't use your iPad for five minutes. That doesn't work. Yes. So um, I think all of us as parents would love to be authoritative, because <laughs> that does look like the best one. But, um, <laughs> but um, I guess the question is, sometimes children and parents have different personalities, and I often wonder if this child in a different family with a different parent personality. So are some children better with a parent that's not authoritative? Um, absolutely. I mean, there's a lot of other factors like temperament that play into it, right? Um, and um, a whole host of other factors. So absolutely, and sometimes it's finding the right person to address the a particular issue and figuring out within the family who is the right person to do that. Whether it's um, 
playing tag, tag teaming, um, but having that dialogue with the adults in the house prior or after the problem has occurred, and you're like, hey, this is a problem, I'm not managing it well. But there also has to be that recognition, right? So yes, there is um, uh, you know, an opportunity to really have that dialogue and something to suggest in practice. Other questions? Comments? Then we have our permissive parent. Um, you know this parent. Um, the one who, you know, is um, very indulging of a child. There's a lot of warmth, there's a lot, a lot of responsivity, but there's not a lot of boundaries or structures or expectations. I always say to parents and to, um, when I worked in schools with teachers, that kids will always meet our expectations, right? And we don't even have to say what our expectations are in many cases. They know, right? And I think that that information is conveyed in a bunch of different ways. And then we have the neglectful and disengaged style that is really characterized by low warmth and a lack of control and structure and expectations in the home and within the family. So parenting quality has been associated with a lot of different outcomes, with the mo most robust outcomes being around aggressive behavior and delinquency. And we find this in the parents who are more authoritarian, who are more controlling. Um, there seems to be a somewhat of an association between the manifestation of this behavior um, at every age. We've also found um, depression, anxiety, somatic complaints, internalizing disorders that are associated with parent quality. High-risk health behavior is the use of illicit drugs, alcohol experiment, experimentation, alcohol abuse, sexually risky behavior, a child's own view of him or herself. Self-esteem is directly correlated with parenting quality. Social competence. Cognitive and academic outcomes. Physical injury or accidents. Stability and the quality of the parental child relationship is linked to a secure attachment. So wow, no pressure for parents, right? <laughs> How many people in this room have children of their own? What would you say is the biggest challenge you've had as a parent? There's a lot. <laughs> <laughs> or one. Guilt. Guilt. Not being there enough. The right. Let's confess. <laughs> So we've moved to a place where, especially in New Jersey, you can't really have a parent stay at home, right? It's um, not financially viable. Most parents have to work. Guilt comes. I had guilt driving up here this morning. <laughs> I had to send my daughter to her dad's house to stay overnight so I could get here on time. And she called me this morning and said, I don't know where my field hockey uniform is. <laughs> and I kept thinking, maybe it's in the laundry room. Guilt, what else? What are some of the other problems that you face as a parent? Um, yes? I guess tempering expectations. We have a lot of expectations about our kids. And we have to put them aside and allow them that's right. Remember the Tiger Mom book? Oh, yeah. Right? And um, the helicopter moms and, um, and, and sort of this pressure. One of the things that I was always, um, I'm 47, by the way, just so you understand the generation I'm coming from. Um, one of the things when I worked, my group of kids when I was a practicing psychologist was middle schoolers and high schoolers. And one of the things that I noticed is um, the immense amount of pressure that we put on our kids to perform 
sometimes at the exclusion of all other things that are important. And the parents were really, in many cases, the people holding the torches. Um, and not with malintent, but actually really good intent. And so much so that um, there's now research that shows that when our kids get to college, when they've had those really high expectations, again, at the exclusion of other areas of their life, that they really struggle in college to perform because they don't have all the other skills that would allow them to function independently to buffer up and to support them in continuing to achieve in the absence of having the parent who's there to provide the structure and support in the face of those high expectations. So, and actually someone coined it as um, snowflakes. Those are our snowflakes, and not any reference to the current political climate, by the way. Uh, that was a, a word that came out to describe that cohort of freshmen in college um, quite some time ago. But expectations, absolutely. Tempering them. What else? Some of the other things that I think are really important to discuss, and I'm just going to touch on these briefly, conflict in the home, loss, substance use in the home, <coughs> smoking. One of the things that I found in my research um, when I did my master's is I, I looked at the intergenerational transmission of violence. And for con college students, I, I had a very small, I had a large sample, but it was all college students in all honesty. So take it for what it's worth. Kids that were uh, victims of abuse in the home, well, it will not surprise you, were more likely to be involved in interpersonal relationships that were characterized by violence, some kind of domestic violence. What I found that was even more interesting that the research supports is that kids that witnessed or observed domestic violence had the same risk for entering into an interpersonal relationship in their adult life characterized by domestic violence. So it's not only being a victim, it's also hearing it. Um, whether it is physical violence or verbal aggression between parents, between siblings, um, having that as part of the background, what is called background anger in the home can have a significant development on a significant impact on development and, and future functioning in interpersonal relationships. Loss. What, I, what I'm always surprised about when I meet with families um, is that you can do a full clinical interview and hit all the areas of the biopsychosocial assessment. And you could say, you know, what, what do you think is sort of perpetuating or causing uh, your daughter or son's um, problems right, right now? You know, again, I'm not, I don't know. I'm not really sure. There's nothing really happened. And then you ask, have there been any significant losses? Well, you know, his um, grandfather did die three months ago. But, you know, or, um, you know, we did move um, from North Carolina last year. I guess, you know what, he's never really been the same. Knowing to ask those questions about changes that represent any kind of loss, uh, whether it's what we traditionally think of when we think of loss, uh, a death, or um, even a, a divorce, we have to remember that there's other types of loss. Change in community, change in schools, uh, natural disaster. Um, you know, community violence due to a, a new place that a child has moved into, which is very different than the home that they used to live in. Moving from a house to an apartment, apartment to a house, moving in with your relatives, because maybe there's a financial burden. Um, I, I found that parents and caregivers don't always identify those problems readily because it is so much a part of their functioning and their norm, and that it takes the question to have them pause to be able to identify that that could be part of what is perpetuating some of the symptoms and some of the problems and challenges they're seeing at home with their child.
So I wanted to just distribute something. I know there are few it sounds like I'm using are you all currently in practice seeing kids? Yes? Okay. I know um, just from the number of hands that were raised that not many of you are using the screening forms in your office. Uh, can you tell me why? Because we're so special. So, so we see patients right there. So we have a few If we adjust that according to their practices, yeah. the most, yeah. those that see the most primary care. All right. Do you use the ACE survey at all in your, in your practice? Yes. Okay. Yes. The ACE, um, the list, does everybody know what the ACE is? It's, I keep Adverse, adverse experiences. Yes, that's a wonderful tool. If you have the time to utilize it, um, it's very helpful in identifying any kind of adverse childhood experiences that it has developed and any kind of um, functioning in all areas and all the ways. Um, the one thing I would say about the AIDS, I, I, what is your experience with the AIDS? So I'm in subspecialist, so I don't use it, but I got excited about it. So the people in our primary care practice, some of them are, are starting to use it. We wanted to get an idea about what the prop for the moms, yeah. not for the children. We're asking the moms if they had bad experiences as children growing up. Um, and once we identify the scope of the problem, then we can later look at how to do it. So it's a project that we can do. I just got excited about it. That's good. You got excited about it. Even though I don't have a <laughs> what is your special? I'm a geneticist. Okay. Diane, let me just jump in. For our primary care offices, we have instituted the ACE, um, the PSC 17, and the CRAF. Um, when our pediatricians are making referrals to the Essex Hub, um, we are asking them to complete those tools to send in order to make the referral. Okay. So I think it is harder to incorporate it into everyday functioning independent of the hub. That's the sense. Yes. I was going to say we use, well, I use the PHQ-9, okay. and I find that's like a good screening tool it is. for the teenagers. And then I'm thinking, like, last week I saw a 15-year-old, and when you mentioned mom, I said, oh, my God, that's her. So just by the PHQ-9, it's nice and quick. Yeah. And then, you know, some things like lit up. So we were further, I was able to like, talk to her and see, like, what was, you know, why was she, like, depressed or lost? And then she said, well, the move, she moved from New York to New Jersey to live with her father. And she said, New York is, like, totally different from what New York was. So, you know, when I told the father, so she said, her father's like, wow, I have, like, no idea. I just moved her here, you know, just to get a better life. So I wanted us to be together with the family. But anyway, I didn't defer to the father. Thank you. Oh, that's interesting. So, yeah, so, I mean, the PHQ-9 is good. It that's probably the shortest screening tool that you can find. There's a, I think there's a three question, three PHQ-9, it's one, two question, right? Um, but yes, the PHQ-9 is, is great to assess um, symptoms of depression. Um, what are other people using that are using the screening in their practice? Um, if, let me ask you, have you found that um, people are completing them accurately? The PHQ-9, but the ACEs, I no. try to get them to do it. So we have it in English and Spanish and yeah. the yeah. Also, yeah. Everyone is, no, 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 they used to look at all the, no, 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 none of this bad stuff. Yeah. Um, so uh, we have to tell them that this is the question to It's not because it's not going to be And we have five more minutes. Okay. Um, and I'll move on. The only thing I want to say about the ACE, which I think is really important and often uh, not taken into the equation, um, is that I think this is a really hard uh, survey to, hey, you're asking about every traumatic experience or 
Yeah, I think it's <laughs> right. And so you're sitting in, and for those who have PTSD or have had a significant emotional reaction and are still struggling, um, you know, you might have someone who's having flashbacks in your waiting room. So I just want to say that. One thing that I want you to consider, maybe, you know, if have time, um, in terms of this presentation, I, I, I am familiar with the screen that you're using. What I'm challenging you to do, and if it's realistic, um, it's nothing else just to get you thinking. There's something called a family psychosocial screen, which I'm passing out now. I'm passing it double-sided. It's pretty dense. A lot of information at the beginning you collect on your own. I want to turn your attention, and it's not completely cultural sensitive, so it asks questions about how to your family history, but it also asks the caregiver about their own history, about their own caregiving experience, about their own childhood experience, and this can be really helpful, and again, you can set by sort of your next step in terms of questions you might ask when you're finally face-to-face. Um, it is lacking some cultural sensitivity. Not everybody has a bite to ask about the drug. Did the child have a bike? Do they wear a helmet? So I want you to, you know, sometimes when I build these screens, I say to parents, most of the time, listen, tell me these questions are just plain silly. I want you to know that it's standardized, it's been given to a lot of people, but sometimes it just doesn't apply, and you don't have to complete the questions that don't apply to you, so that people are not feeling defensive as they, as they complete it. But it is a really good standardized tool. Um, the scoring instructions are on the third or the second page. Um, that can be utilized in practice. Um, and I guess, you know, what I really want to convey is not only just want to screen just the children and adolescents for symptoms, we really want to understand what's happening in terms of psychosocially, in terms of a larger family context. This is probably the only tool that really exists that is more standardized that I could find to really share with you. Um, I often find that people, even though these screens are not only always valid and some people refuse to complete them, they're only one piece of the pie, I often find that people will write something that would never say to you face to face. So I had a mother who was in a session who had been you know, in individual therapy for eight months. And we had to implement a screening, an um, alcohol assessment screening, very short, and audit. And she completed it, and we looked at it afterwards, and we realized she had a significant alcohol use problem. And by the following week, we had her in a full day partial program for alcohol use, uh, for alcohol dependence. And it really helped to tr turn her life around. And it was the shame and the guilt um, associated with having to look at someone face to face and I'd say, I'm struggling with it. And I think often parents, because of the responsibility we place on them, because they're so important in children's lives, because they are our number one recruiter, are often hesitant to share things that are not going well at home. So I offer you this tool as something to utilize. And it's also an opportunity to enhance trust. Um, in a relationship that, um, in many cases, is already characterized by that. Um, in terms of your continuity of the relationship. And I'll end with this one quote, quote, people don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. Doesn't matter how smart you are, at the end of the day, what everybody says, when we survey medical offices across the nation, about 76,000, what everybody said in customer satisfaction is that they base their entry into and continued utilization of um, a medical practice based on their experience interpersonally, not based first and foremost on the care they were provided. So I've always said to everybody that I've trained, and I try to live this mantra, and it's one of the reasons why when someone calls me Dr. Salvador, I say, who is that? Um, because I don't know that the degree so much matters. The training gives you the framework for the work that you're doing, gives you the knowledge and expertise, but unless you have the ability to connect with the person sitting in front of you, whether it's a caregiver or a child, it doesn't matter. So use this as a tool for a conversation. Kick the child out of the room. Kick the parent out of the room. Have a conversation and ask some of the questions. It might just open up the door. Even if it's one, it's Thank you very much.